Thank you, Jim. At this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Bob Pretty. Bob Pretty is the news direct director of Missouri Net. And you know, Bob, I really have trouble with that. I always want to say Missouri Internet. I don't know why, but uh, Missouri Net, uh, which is a commercial radio network. Bob is a historian who has written five books, three based on his popular daily program, Across Our Wide Missouri. His fourth book is a biography of Thomas Hart Benton and his great painting at the Missouri Capitol. The book is Only the Rivers Are Peaceful, the Missouri Mural of Thomas Hart Benton. His newest book, The Art of the Missouri Capitol, History and Canvas, Bronze and Stone, was written with co-author Jeffrey Ball. Just a couple things I'd like to say about Bob. His 35-year-plus career as a news director of the Missouri Net, he's led efforts to open Missouri's government to its citizens. Very important issue. In 210, the Board of the Radio and Television News Directors Association and the Board of Trustees of the Radio and Television News Directors Foundation presented him with a Distinguished, distinguished Service Award. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the State Historical so Society of Missouri, President of the Board of Trustees of the Friends of the Missouri Archives for nine years. He's led other uh, civic and professional organizations. I thought it was interesting to note that he is a Kentucky colonel and admiral in the Missouri Navy, which I was never really sure we had a Navy, but uh, <laughs> interesting point. He graduated from the University of Missouri with a degree in journalism and has done some graduate work also. He re in 2002 received the School of Journalism Honors Medal, which is the highest recognition for a career in journalism. Bob and his wife Nancy have been married since 1967, have two children, and are involved in many activities. Without uh, further ado, would you please welcome Bob Pretty. Thank you for asking me to be here with part of your meeting today. I, you're, all, you're all teachers, retired teachers, are you? Yeah, you don't look so tough. <laughs> of course, I'm not 10 years old anymore either. <laughs> I hope you have a chance to, uh, take, to visit the Capitol today, not just to uh, twist arms of your legislators, and they badly need it, uh, but also to uh, enjoy the Capitol. Most people go to the Capitol when they're in the fourth grade, and they don't ever go back. And that's a real shame because the Capitol needs to have the people of Missouri interested in it. It is our greatest state symbol and is a special place, not just for its architecture and its artwork, but because of what happens there and the miracles that occur in that building every year. I'm going to talk about some of them this morning. Um, after hearing that outstanding obituary of me, I, <laughs> I, uh, I want you to know that I spend hours covering what happens in the Capitol. When the Senate is in session, I am usually at the Senate press table. I don't know why I do that year after year. It's kind of like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer, you know. <laughs> it feels good when you stop. Uh, but uh, a, good, a, good, a good part of the time, the, the hours of boredom are enlivened by special adventures into tedium. And, uh, and occasionally we do have a few moments of drama. Sometimes the days are very, very long. Occasionally when the majority leader of the Senate decides that by God something is going to pass today, no matter how long it takes and how painful it is. Uh, the majority leader of the Senate told me yesterday, in fact, that when the special session is held tomorrow, the Senate will stay in session until they're done with all of this stuff. Well, there are 29 bills in the House and the Senate for them to consider, so that means it's going to be another one of those very long nights, I'm afraid. It's, uh, it, it, I, I, I am often amazed, though, at how often things do happen in that Capitol that are, quite frankly, miracles. And Jim Kreider can tell you firsthand how some of that really happens. Realize that there are 197 people that serve in the General Assembly, and every one of them is different. When all the seats are there, there are 34 senators and 163 members of the House. And each of those people comes here to Jefferson City with their own personal interests, with their own personal standards, their own personal dreams, their own personal ambitions, on top of all of their political dreams and ambitions. 
Each of them will represent something in the neighborhood of 35 to 150,000 other individuals just like you, and not all of you are alike, and so they are representing all of the people like you who are very, very different one from another. That is their job. That's what you elect them to do, to represent you and all of your differing ambitions, dreams, needs, desires, and hopes. They have to gauge when to side with the majority of the folks who are voting on a particular issue, whether to keep faith with the people back home or whether to keep faith with those who are suggesting they vote some way or another, or to keep faith, for that matter, with themselves and with their own standards. It has sometimes forgotten that they are not just representatives from your district or senators from your district. They are state representatives, and they are state senators. And sometimes they need to balance what is good for their district versus what is good for the state as a whole. That brings them into conflict sometimes within themselves. Outside in the hallway are a couple of hundred well-dressed people who want them to vote one way or another on an issue and are capable of exerting enormous influence and pressure upon them to cast their votes for certain issues or on certain matters in certain ways. These people exert, exert an enormous amount of pressure, and I believe that it is an increasing amount of pressure, and unfortunately, it is felt within the chambers. They have rules in the House and the Senate that say lobbyists cannot be on the floor of the House and Senate while it is in session. But these days, all they have to do is pull out their cell phone, their Blackberry, or whatever, and they can get the messages right there from the people that are in the hall saying, do this, do that. The legislators and the lobbyists are in the chamber together. It's unfortunate that we have reached that point. They have to balance party loyalty with district loyalty, with personal loyalty, with constituent loyalty. They are doing all of these things. Every year, a couple of thousand bills are introduced in the House and the Senate. And somehow, amid all of these conflicting pressures, within and without, these members, these House and Senate members, the 197 men and women, somehow they will find an agreement on 100 to 200 of these bills. I don't know how they do it. I consider that to be a miracle when they were able to find, with all of the competing interests, enough votes to get a majority on 100 to 200 of them. Sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes they don't do it very well. And that's why we're having a veto session. The 29 bills that the governor says are flawed to one degree or another, some very badly, some just poorly written. That's another thing I've noticed, is that members of the legislature don't seem to be able to write bills as well as they used to, and fewer and fewer of them seem to read the darn things. There are more and more people who tell them what's in a bill, and they vote for that too often. But consider that they are able to reach those agreements. Now, I want you to think about your own home life. How many times are you unable to agree what to have for dinner? If you can't agree to have something for dinner within your own household, how hard do you think it is to find agreement on a couple of hundred bills, many of which are life and death issues over here in the Capitol building every year? So as much as we may criticize the members of the legislature from time to time, especially if they pass something that is against our personal interests, we have to admire the fact that, number one, they're willing to enter that arena. They are willing to stand within that ring of fire, and they are willing to stake their futures in one way or another on what they do. And we have to pay attention to what they're saying and what they are doing, and we have to hold them accountable. And we have to do it not just for our own interests alone, but what is for the best interest of the state. The Capitol building represents the best of Missouri. Capitals are supposed to represent the best of a people. They are supposed to represent the best of a state. And we hope that the people who serve in them represent the best of the people and the best of the state, too. Capitals are intended to be more than just office buildings where laws are passed and state business is done. Capitals are symbols of the highest ideals of a state. They are symbols of the power and the greatness and the dignity and the nobility of a state and its people. They are symbols of the best in all of us. That is what capitals are all about. They are places that should provoke inspiration and create appreciation for what we are and have an understanding that we can be more than we are. Missouri's capital stands today on land that was occupied at one time by another capital building that burned in 1911. It is the best thing that ever happened to Jefferson City when that lightning bolt struck that capital on February 5, 1911 and burned the old building. 
which was a fire trap and was 70 years old and inadequate at that time. At that point, when the fire started in that capital, after the lightning stroke, struck, there were great fears that Jefferson City would lose its position as the seat of state government. Even as that fire was still burning on that Sunday night, telegrams were arriving in Jefferson City from cities throughout the state, inviting the legislature and the state government to meet in those cities until the decision could be made about what to do about Jefferson City. At 10.45 that evening, University City sent a telegram inviting the legislature to meet there. Now that the Capitol was gone, it was still burning, and the line at the bottom of the telegram said, and we invite you to stay. Throughout a long campaign that summer, after the legislature adopted two bills, one saying there would be a $3.5 million bond issue to construct a new capital in Jefferson City, if that did not get a two-thirds vote on August the 1st, 1911, there would be a second bond issue submitted for $5 million with no location mentioned, opening the gates wide open to a competition from West Plains to St. Joseph for where the Capitol would be rebuilt. Jefferson City campaigned hard to get the two-thirds votes it needed. There was a former member of Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders, Jim, who lived down in West Plains, by the name of Jay Torrey, who offered a million dollars and a hundred thousand acres of land if the state government would be moved to his farm south of West Plains. And he maintained his campaign throughout that whole summer. And on August the 1st of 1911, the bond issue got about 73 percent of the vote. And so state government was guaranteed to stay in Jefferson City. And for the first time since this city became the state capital in 1826, its future as the seat of government was guaranteed. And only then did Jefferson City have the security of knowing that it would always be the state capital of Missouri. Only then did it become possible for you to come here for your meeting instead of perhaps going to West Plains, University City, St. Joseph, Cameron, or any number of other cities that offered to be the new state seat of state government. The Capitol was constructed over a period of several years. It was built during the World War I years, actually, although there was a Capitol Commission that was established in 1911, shortly after the election, of four people, um, four good, true people. And I will, I will note at this point that it was an unusual commission in today's terms because it was a commission that was established by the legislature, and there were no requirements that a member of the legislature or two or three be on it. It is hard today to have the legislature establish a commission and give it any independence at all, because every time a commission, it seems, is established, especially a citizen's commission, there has to be a couple of members of the House and a couple of members of the Senate who are on it. This group, fortunately, was able to operate independently of the General Assembly, and they had to assert their independence from time to time. Building a capital is a difficult job. In those days, they wanted to have a contest to pick an architect for our capital building. And so they put out the word, we're going to have a contest. The American Institute of Architects in Washington, D.C. put out the word, any AIA member who takes part in this contest as they have drawn it up will be ineligible to be a member of the AIA, and we will not support the contest because it violates our contest rules. And so our Capital Commission Board spent a year, just about, arguing with the AIA over what kind of requirements our new architects should have to meet to build our new capital. They finally worked out a compromise. A lot of it had to do with the fact that our laws required our that preference be given to local people and local stone and local products in the construction of the building. They finally found a way to work around that, held the contest, which was the first state capital contest in America that was sanctioned by the American Institute of Architects. They picked an architect from New York, an architectural firm named Tracy and Swartout. I love names from 100 years ago. You know, we don't have names that are really neat names anymore. We had a senator named Xenophon P. Wilfley once. <laughs> I don't know if you can imagine anybody named Xenophon running for the U.S. Senate today. I certainly can. The winners, the architectural firm that won that competition, was led by Evarts Tracy, E-V-A-R-T-S, Tracy, and Edgerton Swartout. Um, you don't hear those names either very much anymore. <laughs> 
They'd never designed a Capitol before. Although they had designed some buildings at Harvard, they designed a courthouse in Denver, they designed a big building in Chicago and other structures. So their credentials were quite good. Their design was submitted and was part of a list of finalists, and some people went around and looked at the designs that were spread out on a table in a room. Each had a number on it, but no names. The governor had been given an envelopes, a series of envelopes with the numbers on them that matched the drawings, and the name of the architect was in the envelope. When the final selection was made of design number three, they went to Governor Hadley's office, he opened the envelope, and it was Tracy and Swartout. Well, once those people were picked and the designs were drawn, and the designs were quite, uh, quite interesting, because one of the things that was included that was never built, because we didn't really want to spend the money on it, was a, a veranda over the railroad tracks on the river side of the Capitol. It would cover, go over the railroad tracks with steps leading down to the river. Uh, that was never constructed, partly because they couldn't get the air rights to build it from the Missouri Pacific Railroad. But the drawings are still there. And sometimes you will see an old postcard, or you'll see a drawing of the Capitol in the early days that shows that porch out over the, out over the railroad tracks. It was a striking thing, but it never got built. Uh, there was another later proposal in the 1930s for a bridge, kind of like uh, the Potomac River Bridge uh, that leads you from Arlington, Virginia to the, to the Lincoln Monument in Washington, D.C. that would be built from Callaway County over to that part of the Capitol building. That also was never built, partly because, for one thing, there was no way to get the barges under the bridge, so it was never put up. The construction of the Capitol was delayed for some time, uh, partly because they got into a big fight with the contractor. The contractor was a Cleveland firm, John Gill and Sons, and Mr. Gill decided that he was going to bid low and then make a lot of money because he was going to build the capital out of granite mined from a quarry that he proposed to open in St. Genevieve County. Except that the Capital Commission board said granite is too hard to work with, it's too expensive, even though it's durable, it's very difficult to carve, it's very, we don't have the money to do this, and I'm sorry you can't use your stone out of your quarry. They opted for Carthage limestone. Carthage had wonderful limestone, and, and uh, most of our capital is still built of Carthage limestone. The steps back in the 1970s had to be replaced, and unfortunately they were replaced with Indiana Bedford limestone, which crumbles and hasn't lasted very well, and when it gets wet it changes colors and darkens and is not very attractive. Senator from Carthage, Richard Webster, some of you might from that area might remember him, had a fit when they decided to bring in Carthage, uh, bring in Bedford Limestone from Indiana for those steps. He thought it would be ugly, and indeed there are times when it is, and they haven't held up very well. We just last year replaced the whole uh, western, western part of the Capitol porch that leads down to the street because the stone had crumbled so badly. The, uh, the Capitol building eventually uh, started to go up after the settlement of that limestone issue, which took another year. So the capital was just sitting there. There was, there was steel for a superstructure, but the, 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 the stone controversy went on so long that that steel started to rust. So they had to remove the rust. That took some time. Once the stone started going in, they noticed the stone from Carthage was developing stains. And they worried what was going on. They couldn't figure it out for the longest time. And they were worried about how to get the stains out and what they needed to do. And it was finally determined that what happened was there are things called Lewis holes in stone. When you have a stone facade of a building, you have the brick building, the brick part of the building, and then you put the stone on top of that. And so the stone is, is fairly narrow, but it's heavy. And so in order to lift it, they bore holes in each end of that stone so that you can insert metal rods to hoist the stone and carry it. Problem is, those metal rods left rust within the stone. And as the stone sat outside in the elements before it was mounted, it rained or it snowed in there and it froze and, and it, the, the rust that was in there from the metal rods started to seep through the limestone, discoloring the limestone. There are some very early pictures of part of the building that show that there are stains in the walls. And the only thing that they could finally do, they just decided the best thing to do, is to let this stuff leach its way out. But for quite a while, they were afraid that our beautiful capital was going to be a capital that was marred by rust stains in every single block of stone that was going into the walls. There are pictures of people on top of the building, on top of the dome. In 1915, 
they had a topping out ceremony when they had built all of the stone up to the top of the dome and they hadn't put the statue of Ceres up there yet and they put a, they put a stone top on it. And there are pictures of people on a little scaffolding around the top of that dome. Now, next time you're over there, look up there and just imagine people standing on a scaffolding probably no more than four feet wide all the way around that dome. And the photographs are interesting because while these people are there and you, you think it took brave people to get up there in 1915, you have to ask yourself where the photographer was who took their pictures. <laughs> he was in a boat. They had a crane, a derrick, and it basically was a boat of some kind that these people got into and it lifted them up there and they got on the platform. But here, while they're out there on the platform celebrating, is the photographer still in the boat with his great big glass plate camera taking their photographs. It took courage to build the building, but it also took courage to photograph the people who were involved in it. Um, after the building was finished, a new commission was established called the Capital Decoration Commission. It was headed by the man who founded the University of Missouri Art Department, Dr. John Picard. And it, was, uh, it included a, a couple, a, an art gallery operator from, Can from St. Louis, a man who was widely known as, a, as an industrialist from St. Louis who collected books and art. It included a woman who was a member of the DAR from Carrollton and a banker from Kansas City. It's interesting that a woman was included uh, from, from, from Carrollton. Not that she was from Carrollton, but that she was from the DAR. Remember when all of this was going on, women could not yet vote when this commission was established in 1917. But we forget today what a powerful political influence the Daughters of the American Revolution was in Missouri in the years before women could vote. It was the DAR that led us to have a state flag. It was a DAR that convinced the state to buy its first historic property. The Arrow Rock Tavern was the first historic site acquired by the state of Missouri, and the DAR led that. And the DAR led so many other things, too, in the state of Missouri, including the formation of our first official state symbols, things of that nature. So it was a powerful political influence, and it put one of its top officers on this, on this art commission board. Fortunately, when the bonds were paid off for the construction of the building, it was determined that the tax to pay off the bonds had raised $1 million more than necessary. And the only thing that money could be used for was the building. And so this art commission had $1 million, $1,920,000 to decorate our building. You can go to some some internet sites and find out what a million dollars in 1920 is the equivalent of today. It's about 20 million. Imagine decorating a public building with 20 million dollars to hire the finest artists and sculptors and stained glass and tapestry people in America at the time. That is what this commission had. And it was led by people who had the good sense to know about art and public decoration and public service. And again, it didn't have any legislators on it to play politics with, with a million bucks. They wound up hiring some of the no, most noted sculptors in America. And when you go to the Capitol, this is why you'll be seeing three statues by James Earl Fraser, who was one of the foremost sculptors in America for the first half of the 20th century. Every one of you in this room has owned at one time or another a James Earl Fraser piece of art. Some of you might even have some of it with you. James Earl Fraser is the designer of the Buffalo Nickel. He also is best known for a great statue of his called the End of the Trail. That's the man. You've seen the statue, whether you've seen the statue itself in its own guise or whether you've seen it on velvet paintings or whatever. It is the statue of an exhausted Indian slumped over his exhausted horse with the head down. The wind is blowing from their back. That's James Earl Fraser. He did three statues for our building. N.C. Wyeth, you might be more familiar with his son Andrew, who was a great American painter, and died not too many years ago. N.C. Wyeth, the father of Andrew, was the greatest illustrator at the time of magazine articles in America when he was hired to do two large murals of Civil War battles. He felt that his commission here would change his career from being seen as an illustrator to being an artist. And in fact, that is what this Capitol building did for his career. Before this paintings he did for the Capitol, he was known primarily as the illustrator, and most of his work was in illustration of books and magazines. Afterwards, 
His illustrations declined markedly, and he became more and more as great, known as a great muralist. When you walk into the Capitol and you walk into the rotunda, you will see one of the most amazing stories of the entire Capitol. All of those paintings all the way up to the dome, the paintings down in the lower rotunda that depict primitive Missouri and the, the symbols of the things that we use to try to civilize Mother Nature in the lower rotunda, all of those soaring 22-foot tall, 45-foot wide paintings in the rotunda of the third floor, and that 36-foot diameter painting in the eye of the dome were all done by Frank Brangwen, who is still today considered Great Britain's foremost 20th century muralist. The amazing thing about all of those paintings is that Sir Frank Brangwen was never in Missouri. He was never in the United States. He never saw this building. He painted all of these large paintings in London. They were rolled up and they were brought to the Capitol. They were laid out on the Capitol lawn where white lead glue was applied to the back of them with brooms. And more white lead glue was spread on the walls in the rotunda with brooms. And they were then brought in and they were rolled up. And they pretty much fit. They had to do some trimming to make sure all of the angles. But consider when you walk in there, you're looking at paintings that had to deal with curves like this and curves like this, and he got them right. In London, So as you look at the paintings and you can marvel at the beauty of the paintings, also marvel at the ingenuity and the talent and the creativity of the man who painted them. You can buy my book if you'd like, I hope you do, um, which will explain the history and the story behind all of this artwork. It's, it's been a wonderful adventure trying to find all of this stuff and I could talk to you all morning about it and I'm not just about to. Class has to end sooner or later. But I hope you do go to the Capitol and I hope you enjoy seeing things at the Capitol. The unfortunate thing about the art of the Capitol is it is too often underappreciated and it's poorly cared for. There's been a lack of interest for many years in, in taking care of the greatest symbol that we have of our state, our Capitol, and the great artwork that is in it. It has been neglected, the building and the, and the artwork. I have seen one estimate that says it'll take $100 million to restore our Capitol, to repair it. It has leaks in the basement where water pours in by the gallon when it rains. It is so bad there are, what do they call them, stalactites? Is it stalactites or stalagmites that hang from the ceiling? I can never remember. One or the other, they hang from the ceiling. That's how bad it is in the basement of the Capitol in some places. Paint peels from the walls. Great architectural details that were once emphasized by the design are now covered up by layer after layer of paint. Um, something has to be done with our great symbol, our Capitol. But we have had in the last several years, as all of you know too well, a, t a mood in our politics that says spending government money is bad. The common thing said today is, well, the people know how to spend their money better than government does. Ask yourself how many of your neighbors would sit down every year in April and write a check for $500 to the public school system instead of paying taxes. Do the public really know how to spend its money better than government does? You folks are the beneficiaries of that. You know, you have the answer. It is sometimes saddening to see the state of our capital as inspiring as it is and inspiring as it should be. But as long as we have people who now are in charge of our state budget, who think that the best thing to do is reduce state spending, not take care of the problems that already reductions have caused, our capital is going to be troubled. Somebody needs to speak for our capital. Somebody needs to speak for this great symbol of our state. Somebody needs to speak for the state itself and its people. The people who need to do that are the people. The people who need to do that are the ones who believe in the state and a state capital that can be greater than it is, better than it is, if we have the courage to address the problems as a people, not as an interest. Sometimes I have the feeling after watching the legislature for 40 years now, that the state of Missouri is not being governed as much as it, is, as it is being run. Run by people in the hallways with their blackberries, sending messages into the chambers, expressing interest in what the votes should be. Well, maybe we have some people here who can advocate for people, not just teachers, but people at large, the state at large. And we can look at our capital and we can say, 
If we all could be as noble and as beautiful and as strong as our capital is, all of us would be better. I hope you have a chance to go to the Capitol. I hope you have a chance to see it in all of its glory, as well as some of the dusty corners and peeling paint. Appreciate that, too. Because in many ways, the Capitol does represent Missouri. It represents not only strength and beauty and power and possibilities, it represents also needs that are unmet and obligations that are unfilled. So our Capitol is a symbol of ourselves. Sometimes it embarrasses us. Sometimes it glorifies us. But that's what Capitals do. Thanks for coming to Jefferson City. I hope you have a chance to go visit it today.